Hello, this is Anne de Geest. Welcome to the YouTube channel called Anne Insights. Uh, these are apolitical and science-based uh, updates on COVID. Uh, this week is really critical. Uh, in the last two weeks, I was able to attend several webinars with some of the thought leaders on infection control and vaccine. And I am summarizing this information in two videos. One is showing the upsurge in the US and the fact that Europe is now having a second wave that's higher than the first one. And the second video is something you don't want to miss. Uh, I'm talking about uh, how can you build your immune system and your own resilience program? And then number two, what does it mean to have an effective vaccine that's approved? And do you still have a 50 to 70% chance of being infected? I need your help. I really want you to help me spread the word and this knowledge. The next four weeks to six weeks are gonna be critical in the US to stop the surge that is happening so we don't have the same problem that's happening in Europe. So please help me, give me a thumbs up and share, the, share, share these videos. Let me now share my screen and let's start with the first or the second video. Okay, welcome uh, to an Inside. This is the, uh, the second video on October the 9th on the clinical update. Um, please take a look at my first video uh, on epidemiology. Lots of things happening there. U.S. has lost control. You'll see a lot of the states are really growing at 50 to 100 percent in the last couple of weeks. In, a... uh, in, in this video, I'm going to talk about what exactly is an effective vaccine and what's your infection risk. Uh, what is happening with the approval and the timeline based on some big webinars I was able to attend this week. And what can you personally do for yourself and your loved one to improve your personal resilience program and improve your immune system? So uh, a very interesting article today in the New York Times uh, that shows using electron microscopes what COVID looks like. And you can see they superimpose some graphic there. So this is a picture of COVID next to it. You can see the core of the COVID there with all the famous spikes we talk about that connect to the ACE2 receptors and then the inside of the virus that comes inside and duplicate themselves. They also were able to show the spike protein. It turns out they are like algae. They kind of move around. They're very flexible, very unusual. They're, not a, a, they're, they're basically not like a spike. It's kind of the reverse triangle there. So if you have a chance to take a look at the New York Times today, there's some really cool pictures. So what we know, not too much has changed for the last two weeks. Uh, we know that you know, 40 to 50% are asymptomatic. So study just came out today showing it could be as high as 80% of people get tested that were asymptomatic. It just came from the UK. And there's a super spreading event, which is 10% of the events are driving 80% of the transmission there. And the long-term damage of COVID is, we're gonna talk, is getting more and more confirmed. What we don't know yet, which we'll talk about is that, what does, what does it mean to have an effective vaccine and how does that protect you? So uh, please take a look at my August 7 video on all the symptoms that, that can happen there on, on, on COVID there. Um, and uh, news came this week. Uh, if you have a Neanderthal gene, so if you've done a 23 in me, you know, go check it out to see if you have Neanderthal gene. It turns out you may have a three times higher risk of developing a severe COVID. And the analysis has come up in the Nature article this week that around 16% of Europeans have that mutation as well as 50% of the Asians. And these two genes, one genes has a role in the immune response and so therefore doesn't create uh, the same type of response that you have with other people there. And there's another gene that is linked to the mechanism what the virus is using to, to invade human cells. Now, um, that if you are if you have the Neanderthal genes, you may have some higher sensitivity to pain. The positive will also decrease the risk of miscarriage. And these genes can be tested. So more information is probably gonna be published on exactly what these genes are. Another thing that came out is what's called the autoantibodies. And there is another gene mutation there that somehow is helping the virus attack the body. And, and what it does is that it stops the way the body responds with interferon. And, and so as a result of that, when we get the initial attack of the body, the body doesn't create the interferon, which is our first level of defense. And, and our innate immune system is not responding the way it does for the average population. And these genes you know, can be tested. And there's two groups. It turns out around 10% of people have this autoantibody against the interferon, which most of the time it's not a big deal. It turns out, unfortunately, with COVID, it is a big issue. And 95% of those are men. 
And that may explain why we're seeing so many men have a higher mortality rate and a higher severity rate than the women. And there's a variation in 13 genes, so it's not just one gene. And, and again, it goes back to that interferon, that we're not producing enough of that interferon there. This is a study that was done by the NIH on a thousand patients. Now, people can be tested to see have the, if they have that presence of that autoantibodies. So the good news is every week we're learning more and more about are there some subgroups of the population that are higher risk? And if you are, you know, you should probably take extra steps. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is this famous K factors we have talked in prior video. The K factor is what's measuring how a virus is spreading itself. So, for example, the flu is passing from one person to another like a domino effect. This virus, the COVID, is really needs a cluster. It needs a critical mass of people put together there. And, and this is what more and more data is coming out that 10 to 20% of infected people are driving 80 to 90% of the COVID transmission. And so let's go from some of the data that just came out recently. In India, a study they have done on 600,000 cases that they did the contact tracing. So that's a massive data set. They show that two things, 8% of the case drove 60% of transmission and the high percent of the case never transmitted. They, although they were infectious, nobody was traced to them, at least that they could find it. But here's the interesting thing, the highest transmission were from children under the age of 15 which does tie to some of the data we found from Europe where you, you saw the school reopening and an increase in infection rate. In New Zealand, 19% of the cases um, uh, were due to one, uh, one person driving the infection there. And in South Korea, there was one patient, they call him patient 31, that drew 5,000 cases. Uh, and then, of course, there was the famous church cluster, if you remember there, uh, where they all start singing and getting together there and all of that. And that drove 60% of the South Korean cases. And we know South Korea is probably the best managed one. So the good news, some of these countries there, they're doing great contact tracing. And so they're able to really understand the dynamic of transmission. So the super spreading cluster is really what we need to control. If we could just in the US avoid I hate to say political rallies, I know it's a political charge uh, period right now, but please stay away from indoor, poor ventilation, crowded, where you are in there for more than 15 minutes with people who may be at risk. And, and so uh, that is what we need to really do in the next several months to control this. If we're able to bring down the infection rate to below 5%, then contact tracing can be effective. We, contact tracing, when you have an infection rate over 10 to 20%, that what happened in, in the White House uh, Rose Garden there, is so many people could contaminate, there's no way they could do contact tracing anymore because it basically went to thousands of people in a short period of time. And as you know, we talked about doing wastewater and, and testing there because that can identify infection rate like in, a, like in a, um, a college, you know, a couple of weeks before there's a major outbreaks. Another thing that came out is what is the decay of the aerosol? You know, the aerosol is like the smoke coming out of somebody that stays in the air. And, and, and the data came out of, of the government there showing that there's different ratios and it's linked to humidity and the UV index, the UV index being the biggest driver. So in this case, you can see this 30% of the aerosol that decay per minute, so it's very quickly. Uh, if you are into high UV, i.e. you're in the sun, it's also, that's the biggest driver. You also relate to humidity. We talk about the fact when there's low humidity, what happens, the particles get very, very small and light because there's no water inside there and they float in the air for a longer period of time. Um, and of course, a higher temperature. So if you want to have fun, go to this uh, website and I'll post it on, on YouTube and you can play with the UV index and the temperature. It will show you what's the, at 99% virus decay, which means how much time you have no virus in the air. And in this case, I play with that with a low UV index. So i.e. probably more indoor, uh, 80, 80 degree Fahrenheit temperature and a low humidity there. You can see it stays in the air for a long period of time, like one hour. But you see, if you, got playing, you start playing with index and you go into high UV and all of that, it drops in a matter of minutes. So you need to be aware of your environment and that's what drives your risk of infection. Two articles on the risk of traveling. And they both are saying that the risk of, of being infected uh, in an airplane is low. Uh, this one is coming out of a JAMA, uh, which is one of the big magazine. And you can see the air inlet is coming from the top and it's pushing downwards and the air outlet is at the bottom of your feet. And, uh, it be, and in, as a result of that, 
uh, they say that if you go into an airplane and you use face covering and you have the, the, no, the air nozzle above your head going straight down, so you're pushing the air downwards, you don't have air coming from the passenger next to you there, and you stay seated, and you have the seat behind you, hopefully protecting you from something behind you there, uh, that you have a low risk of being infected. And some of the data is interesting. So the IATA, which is the International Air Transport Association there, showed there was only 44 reported cases of COVID transmission out of 1.2 billion travelers. And their argument is again the same thing that the other one did is that the air is coming downwards from the top and it's being sucked out at the bottom of your feet. So there's not too much transmission, you know, between rows. Uh, and they are also using a, an exchange rate of 20 to 30 times per hour. Compare that to an office space, it's 10 times higher than you would have in an office in an office space, which means you're probably at higher risk in an office space. And the school are supposed to be 10 to 15 hours, 10 to 15 times per hour. They also have these really super duper HIPAA filters. And, and I'm talking about the new planes as opposed to a very old plane. So be careful what you're, what you're wearing there. And the cases that were reported there, you can see they're all long distance. These are like, you know, 10 to 12 to 14 hour flights. Uh, one of the biggest one was the one from uh, Europe to, uh, I think it was Vietnam, if I remember. Uh, where there were several cases. So just give you, give you the information that you make an educated decision based on that. Winter is coming, uh, anybody that watch HBO. Uh, the flu season is coming. And what that means is that they expect the number of tests to be multiplied by a factor of 5x because people cannot distinguish between the symptoms they have that are due to the flu or if it's due to COVID. That is going to have an impact on our capacity of handling the testing, which is already, as you know, strained. Uh, and and so, so a lot of the ideas to do what's called pool testing, where you combine five or 10 people into one type of testing. And if it's negative, you assume everybody's negative. If it's positive, then you go back and retest each person individually there. Uh, so this interesting thing about the flu. Historically, this is in North America. You can see that you have the flu season is really the peak in January, February, and slowly decay by April. This year, because of COVID, which is the dark, black shirt, we basically shut down everything because we all got indoors wearing masks and not meeting anybody. And you can see how the flu uh, that we had at last winter, they dropped drastically there. Historically start rising up in November and December. Uh, that's a typical phrase. There is a hope uh, of what's happening right now in the, the, the Southern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, they had a significantly lower flu season this year. And, and, and the belief is because everybody is washing their hands, wearing a mask and all of that, the flu is still there, but nobody is getting as contaminated as they are historically there. So the, the hope, if people continue to wear masks and do social distancing and all the good stuff, that we may have a low flu season there, but please take your flu shot because you want to boost your immune system. Let's talk about the long haulers. A uh, study in the UK, in, the, in a BMG, which is one of the top journal there, showed that um, there is no mild COVID. A lot of the people with mild COVID end up with pneumonia and other type of problem there. And, and so we need to start, stop talking about mortality, read about COVID. We need to start talking about what's called morbidity. And morbidity uh, is what we use for people who get, uh, who stay alive, but they have these chronic problems that comes with it. Uh, like diabetes, there's a lot of comorbidity uh, and cardiovascular and all of that. So let's take a look at deep dive. Uh, uh, in JAMA, they just came out. There was a study, in four million, there's a study that has been announced on 4 million people in the US, UK, and Sweden, where we're going to be keeping track of people after three weeks. Uh, the CDC did a phone survey after two weeks from, uh, to see if people had symptoms. 35% of the people reported they still had problems after two weeks. Uh, and 47% were over 50 years old, but 26% were young people there. This is not just for the airline. This happens to everybody. What other problem they see is chronic fatigue is the number one. Uh, I mean, inability of going up a, 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 flight of, a flight of stairs and just being exhausted going on top. A shortness of breath. Uh, this is the worrisome part. Cardiovascular injury. And this is injury that can uh, basically be measured through MRI or blood test. And this showed that between 60 to 46% of people have those heart injuries, including young people. These are infected athletes in colleges. 46% had a myocardial injury marker. Um, and these are people who had mild cases. 
uh, pulmonary dysfunction. These are uh, fibrosis, which is scars inside the lungs. And you can see 64% of the people after three months after discharge had some uh, images showing uh, damage to their lungs. We know from SARS in 2003 that after 17 years, these people never recovered. They still had these permanent damages there. The brain is getting to be a bigger, bigger concern. So we know that the virus goes through the blood brain barrier and it goes two ways. One is for the blood, but the other one for the olfactory nerve, which is why two thirds of people lose their sense of smell and taste. And, and so, um, over 50% of survivors have problems after six months. Is another study that came out of Europe. Uh, only 5% have fully recovered. This is a study between Belgium and the Netherlands uh, that's ongoing on 1,000 people there. 94% uh, of those people were mild patients. They were never hospitalized. They were being treated at home. And 61% had no chronic condition before. They were totally healthy. And you can see 86% have chronic fatigue, 36% of shortness of rest, and 35% of headache. This is really important. The history will show that the mortality was not irrelevant in COVID, but it's going to be catastrophic is this long-term damage on everybody in the population. Uh, another study came out on people who have what's called an altered mental state. And, and it's been reported 32% on the average have basically, who have been hospitalized. 36% in China, as high as 57% in Europe. There is a new study that's just being started uh, called the International Brain Study, uh, which is uh, done by 25 countries in the US, the Alzheimer's Association, the World Health Organization, and they're going to keep track of the long-term problem on the brain at 6, 9, and 18 months. Well, what are we talking about? 62% hospitalized people have neurological manif manifestation, including young people. 82% uh, during the disease. Uh, they're mostly men. 45% uh, complain of what's called myalgia, which is a form of pain. 38% uh, have headaches. 32% have encephalopathy, uh, which is a lot of problems with short term memory, disorientation, stupor, brain fog. And uh, there is a study in Northwest Chicago on 509 hospitalized COVID patients. And uh, so this data is coming more and more that this is a real, a real, real issue. Let's talk about diagnostics. Uh, there's some new PCR diagnostic. If you remember, PCR is the gold standard. That's, that's the technology that look what's the viral load that you have. Typically, the viral load is between day three after you've been exposed to maybe day 10 to 15 is when you have the speak in the viral load and it comes down. Uh, in, in addition to the traditional lab uh, system there, we have several new ones have come out. There's Mesa Biotech as a point of care, which is, can be used, therefore, outside of a lab that could get, give you results in 30 minutes. And we desperately need those type of uh, accurate uh, tests. Uh, Cephate is another one in 45 minutes, but that needs a computer, so it's, it's not as, as mobile. Uh, there's a two saliva one. Uh, that's more of a collection kit, so the, basically you can collect um, you're still alive at home, but you still have to send it to a lab and it still takes a couple of days to get the result. There are some antigen tests, but remember this big controversy uh, with the ABBA that up to 30% of these tests can give you a false, uh, a negative or false positive. Uh, the benefit is that it gives you 30 minutes there. It's still a good test to do if you do it on a regular basis because you will catch people with infections there. It is important to understand that that from the time you've been exposed to the time that the PCR can count the viral load, you're still contagious. But during that first three-day period, the PCR may still be negative. So it is important if you think you've been exposed that you do multiple tests if the first one after maybe one or two days of where you've been exposed is negative because you may still not have built enough of viral load to be the test. So don't, 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 you know, be cautious. Uh, treatment update, Redemzivir, uh, the European Medicine Agency has announced a safety review because acute kidney injury has been reported. There is shortage and allocation all over the world, so we're having a problem in getting access to the medication. Two big news there, the monoclonal antibodies, uh, this is what uh, President Trump used. Uh, there's two of them that have submitted to the FDA for an emergency uh, user authorization. One is by Lilly, and it's a bit complicated. So the cocktail that they want to be used for COVID is a combination of two drugs. And it's a cocktail therapy. And it shows that they lower the viral load after 11 days. Now, remember, the viral load automatically goes down after 11 days. They just lower down a little bit faster than that. 
The data is only on 268 patients and only 112 have received ther uh, therapy. I think it's important to emphasize that all these emergency use authorization on a very small sample in the clinical trials. And they already started doing 100,000 doses uh, with one of the antibody and in order to get both of them, they're not gonna get those until the combination by the end of 2020. So the, the drugs just with one has minimum effect but combining the two drugs together has an effect. So this is not gonna be available until 2020, 2021. Regeneron, which is the one that was used by, by President Trump uh, under the compassionate use, they have just released their phase one on 275 patients. Phase one is basic safety and efficacy there. They want to do a phase two and three on 1300 patients, but they've just submitted uh, yesterday uh, to the uh, FDA, uh, leveraging some of the political wave that's supporting them right now to get authorization there. And they still have limited availability. They only have 50,000 of those available uh, for, for the end of 2020 there. And they're working with Roche uh, to provide those drugs outside the US. Let's talk about vaccine. We're gonna do a deep dive on vaccine. Exactly what does that mean to have a safe vaccine, an effective vaccine? Keep in mind, all the trials right now are done on adults. We don't have trials for pediatrics. It's not expected to have trials on pediatrics until next year. Uh, same thing for pregnant women there. That is an impact there because as we're reopening the school, remember we talk about a lot of those kids have a, a 0.5 chance of getting uh, um, a complication from COVID, but they are vectors. They are viral vectors and they have an infection rate that can be 10 times higher and could be much more contagious. So let's talk about what is a successful vaccine. And I want to make it very clear. This is not the vaccine that you got as a kid, which for the rest of your life is protecting you from that disease. This is not what we're talking about. The definition of the FDA to be approved is an average of 50% efficacy and a lower bracket of as low as 30%. Let me rephrase this. That means you have a 50 to 70% chance of still being infected. I pause there because this is not a protection that won't mean you won't get sick from the, from, the, from the virus. The virus is here to stay. And these vaccines right now have a very low bar. So the next problem is that we're not doing head-to-head -head comparison. Every vaccine trials is against a placebo, i.e. you do nothing. And I'm, I'm going to talk to you about some of the numbers as a result of that. And so how do we define efficacy? Well, every trial is slightly different. So uh, one thing for sure, and we'll talk more about that, it's a way you have a PCR that's positive or not, you know, the diagnostic test, but then you have symptoms and these trials have all different symptoms that they keep track of for the secondary endpoints. So Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J are all measuring slightly different things in how they define the secondary endpoints. And, um, and so let's do, let's do a bigger dive. That's in the US. In Europe, they are doing a trials head to head against different vaccines, which is what normally you would do is to compare one vaccine against another there. And they all share the placebo arm, which is much more effective because otherwise, if you have a trial of a thousand patients there, you need 500 placebo or not. But if you're sharing a placebo arm, you don't have to recruit these 500, you know, patient multiplied by 10 trials uh, and people get nothing. So seven former leader of the FDA sent a letter to say they're deeply troubled by the pressure right now of the White House in forcing the FDA to provide early approval and change the guidance of what is approvable. And this has been going out over the last two weeks. Uh, I give you some of the names. This, this is the who is who of ex FDA commissioner there. And their big concern is that, you know, we want to make sure the population trust this vaccine and take it because you can get a vaccine approved but if nobody takes it you know it doesn't really provide any value so let's let's see exactly what happened two days ago under pressure of the scientific community which from every direction basically says we have to make sure that whatever the fda does it's based on science uh, they finally had a, a clinical criteria there that had been put on hold by the white house and has now been approved that goes into the specific and the specific is that a trial will be approved if it has at least 50% efficacy rate with as low as 30% because you typically have a standard deviation there, which means another way around is you have a 50 to 70% chance that that vaccine will still not help you and you may still get infected there. They are demanding that you have two months of follow-up data uh, on this patient after they've been injected. That was some of the pressure they had from the White House is to do it earlier to make sure you have safety and efficacy because most of the time, 
uh, the, 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 the adverse events from an injection from a vaccine is within 60 days of the injection. So it was really critical that we had a two months follow up to make sure there's no adverse events. Um, and they want to make sure we do severe reaction for at least one month. Uh, remember, AstraZeneca has been put on hold because there's been a spinal reaction there in one patient in the UK. Now, their definition is that if you get five patients in the placebo group that have severe COVID, you can stop there. So very, very low numbers in, in the population there in the control group. And then there's a whole bunch of requirements. I want to go into the detail and manufacturing process and you know, make sure we give an asymptomatic patients there. So even if they are they have the COVID, but we don't know about it because it hasn't been tested, you know, it doesn't create a, an adverse event. So the primary endpoint is that you have a PCR that's positive, so it's consistent there. But then the secondary endpoint is all over the places, and uh, depending on the cases, it's different definition of symptoms. And if you can distinguish between mild and severe, and severe is defined as your oxygen saturation drop below 93%, you're under oxygen treatment there, or you have what's called a shock, which means your blood pressure drop below 90 uh, beat per minute there, and you're in the ICU. Um, and so Dr. Fauci, I was on the webinar with, went into a lot of the detail as well as the head of uh, Operation War Speed. I'm going to share some of these slides because they're very interesting. Uh, it basically says, you know, there's a lot of people uh, involved in the government on the vaccine development there. The FDA and the CDC are involved in the later stage, you know, reviewing the data and making sure the guidelines are done well. But there's a lot of people on BARDA and, and the military in how we're going to handle the logistics and the delivery of the drugs. So there's a lot of players there. Uh, just a quick review, there's different platforms. And, and I, I, I want to refer some of these old vaccines you may be familiar with. So the Ebola and the Zika vaccine, they were using a viral vector. So we have some experience there, but not a huge amount of production there. Influenza is something we know how to make in very high volume. Uh, and this is the protein approach there, which the JNG are using there. So, and then the mRNA is something we've never made uh, in high production. So if you look at all the top contenders there, uh, these are the ones we want to look at. These are the ones in phase two and three, and, and they're coming from three major categories there. And please take a look at my prior videos there when I did a really deep dive on all those vaccines. Uh, these are all the locations worldwide where the trials are happening there. And you can see it's very extensive. And this is something that Dr. Fauci had said organized in the past with some of the prior uh, um, uh, pandemics there, and he's leveraging that network that has been established so that we can have a diversity in where we are testing this vaccine. And that's important there. If you're interested in participating in a trial, uh, this is the website. You can sign up and, and volunteer uh, for a trial there. Uh, they're still ongoingly uh, recruiting people. Remember in the trials, you have a control group and, and that you may not get a vaccine. Uh, Monsef Slaoui is, is the person heading the Operation Warp Speed, is a very credible person there that is working uh, on, on the logistics there. He was being very open. He said, the mRNA, uh, the, which is Moderna and Pfizer there, the earliest we can get is in the fall to get the first efficacy results. Um, uh, the non-repeating live vaccine, which is the AstraZeneca, which is on hold in the US because of the complication that came up in the UK and the JNJ one, the earliest we're going to get data is in early 2021. This is getting the data. That doesn't mean it's available. Uh, the protein subunit, which is uh, Novavax and Sanofi there, is going to be at the end of the first quarter. And the live replicating vector, which takes more time to basically build, uh, but we know how to make a lot of those. Uh, they just are harder to build. That's going to be in late 2021. So the good news, we have a lot of shots on goal, but I want to show this data there that come from the head of the Operation Warp CP, because that means there is no vaccine that's going to be available to us as the main population for at least a good uh, 12 months, I would be my guess. Uh, let me see, why is this thing not working? Here we go, whoops. Uh, large scale manufacturing. We are, the amount of work that needs to be done to manufacture billions of doors, uh, do the supply chain at minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, where the thing can only be defiled for, you know, uh, for a couple of days before they can be injected there. And a lot of this vaccine, like the mRNA, needs a double injection at 28 days apart. Uh, it's massive. It, it's 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 on the scale we have. You know, it's like D-Day. I mean, it's just things we have never done before. So the mRNA is a novel technology. He felt very strongly that there's been a lot of very big milestones that have been accomplished by Moderna and Pfizer, and it is scaling up, and that they will achieve large scale, and and they already start doing stockpiling, uh, waiting for the approval. 
uh, the non-replicant uh, live vaccine uh, is uh, AstraZeneca already is at the industrial scale uh, outside the US. Uh, and uh, John Johnson and Johnson is six to eight weeks behind AstraZeneca, but they have these really major players, uh, you know, setting up to scaling up. So they, he felt very comfortable that the pharma industry is doing parallel tracking in building this large scale manufacturing there. Uh, the protein is much more complex to manufacturing, so he doesn't expect any stockpile until January. And the issue is that you have to grow the protein and put them in sterile vials, and that, that requires like 25 different locations in the US alone to basically coordinate all these manufacturing and logistics there. As far as who's going to get it, uh, it probably is, is expectation, the best case is the mRNA at the end of December may be available and there'll only be 30 million doses, which is around 15, maybe million people there. And that's going to be all the healthcare workers and people at extremely high risk. And, and we'll talk a bit more about that. So if you look at the trials, on the average, every trial has 30,000, J&J is, is 60,000 there. And they all have slightly different, they have to harmonize the endpoints so you can, you can compare them. And uh, Moderna is doing a good job as, uh, uh, as far as having diversity. You can see initially they were mostly white, uh, and, but over time they've been able to diversify the population there with having Hispanic and, and Black African and all of that, because it's really important that we know by different type of subpopulation if these vaccines are safe and effective. How does it work? Let's look at the numbers. Uh, if you look at what we're trying to do, we're giving it to a population of 38,000 people, and then we're seeing if they get sick or not. Uh, and remember, 60 to 80% of people are asymptomatic, and, and some of them will end up in a hospital. We're looking at that se severe case, the 5 to 10% that will end up being hospitalized. So let's play with the numbers. If we terminate the trials too early, we may not have enough data by subgroups, which is the people of the age of 65, people who may be at very high risk in another served population there. And so uh, waiting another seven weeks may make a huge difference between only getting data from 50 people who have been infected in the, in the, uh, versus 150 people, which gives you a much uh, better statistical representation. So let me show you that. You look at the trials, they've been, Moderna is doing the enrollment in August, September. They want to release the data here. I'm talking mid-November that on only 50 people who got infected there. That's a very low numbers there. If you wait seven more weeks, you get 150. That number therefore will give you a better statistical analysis of you know, how effective it is and what the contamination is. Look at the other thing, AstraZeneca. The earlier they could get data on the 50 people, patient there is going to be in January there. Janssen, you know, same thing there. So, so I'm trying to explain that because it is important that when they release this first early data, they will say it works. The end is so low that we want to make sure that the safety and efficacy is something we can trust and rely on. And what we really want is to get to at least 150. And these are the time frame you can see happening here. So why is that? If, if we do an enrollment period, which takes, uh, you know, probably eight weeks there, um, and on 30,000 patients there, statistically, you will only get 50 people infected uh, after week 16. And if you wait an extra seven weeks, you can go from 50 to 150, uh, which is much more reliable. Uh, to give you an idea, if you give 10,000 people the placebo and 20,000 people the vaccine, the people who end up being very severe, maybe only eight people on the vaccine versus 19 people uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the placebo. And so these numbers, you know, they could change a tiny bit by a few people there and that statistically will have a significant impact in, the, in determining if the, the vaccine is effective. So you really want these numbers to be higher than just, uh, and that's at 150. So if we're trying to do that with only 50 people, in fact, you can see that the percent of people are severe is even lower. Uh, so that's, that's the statistical issue about why a lot of the scientific people says we should not read this data too early. We really want to make sure we read it when we have a number of people infected that you can tell the difference between placebo and non-placebo. And this is the 150. So if divided by, by three, you can see this number will be two or three people uh, versus six people there. And that's, that's not you know, very reassuring that we can trust if um, a vaccine is effective. So his recommendation is that it's really important that if we're gonna do a vaccination of 4 billion adults and 3 billion ad adolescent and child, that we have data that's long enough that we can really trust the safety and the efficacy uh, of those data. And remember, this is not for kids or pregnant women. 
So in, in summary, uh, in their rollout, what they expect to do is to give it to 30 million people in a phase one, which is mostly going to be the healthcare workers. Then we're going to go to 85 million people who are at, at high risk, and that's going to be long-term care facilities. And, and people with comorbidity, so very high risk patients there. And then the rest of the population will be in a phase two. So that'll probably be the end of 2021, uh, um, basically would be uh, the way this is all working out. Um, this is the second part of my presentation there. So this is a presentation that was developed by the defense health agencies for their troops. How can we get our soldiers to be COVID resilient? And, and I'm going to share the data there because it's really excellent. And uh, let's do a bit of a backup, which is uh, remember from the time you get exposed between two to 14 days, you are uh, contagious and you can spread uh, the disease. 25% uh, of people uh, can build, a, basically uh, become asymptomatic. I think it could be as high as 40%. And then you have this 20% of people who end up in the hospitals there. So uh, people at higher risk, is it estimated in the US that 45% of Americans are at high risk of COVID complication. And these are people with chronic diseases or obese. Uh, poor diet, uh, only 10% of Americans are eating the recommended uh, fruits and vegetables. So they develop inflammatory pathways that you know, the, the, vaccine, the COVID can leverage. And so I'm gonna talk about how can you increase your immune resilience? And that's doing three things. The PPE, which is your personal protective equipment, i.e. wear a mask and wash your hands. The PPN, which is nutrition and supplements, and we'll talk specifically about that. And the PPL, which is your lifestyle. There are certain things in your lifestyle that can really boost your immune system. This is the first time I've seen this data there on vitamin D. We're talking the best about this data after data showing that taking supplement of vitamin D has a big impact, a big impact in decreasing the severity of, of, the, of your response to COVID. And this is a, a, a data that was showing that if people have this high amount uh, of vitamin D in their blood, you can see st statistically, the majority of them have mild symptoms and there's clearly a correlation with people with a low amount of vitamin D in their blood with severity. So please take vitamin D or D3. Uh, so the key point on the PPE plus PPN plus PPL uh, as the military, so they're very into uh, uh, different formulas there, is that you can really increase your odd of going from, severe, from a risk of being severe to being a mild infection there. So let's talk about uh, the PPE. We all know about masks and all of that. Please look at my prior videos, uh, but we have a lot of information about that. Let's talk about the other two part, nutrition and, and lifestyle. In the nutrition, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on something that's specific on COVID. In general there, this is a very big graphic there, but you know, this is all a traditional one about getting high antioxidants, which is the rainbow of colors for vegetables and fruits. A microbiome, there's a relationship with COVID, you know, if you have an inflammatory problem, problems with your gut, uh, anti-inflammatory in the type of drinks and, you know, avoid sodas and all the other things, all the traditional things you're very familiar with, fiber protein. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the supplement or specific to COVID, uh, where data is consistent to what we have reported in the past. So uh, zinc, uh, 30 to 60 milligram, a viral, a viral replication. So if you do get infected, it decreases the viral load that gets developed in your body and gives a higher chance the immune system can control the virus. Vitamin C, I, I'll take a thousand milligram. Uh, you know, make sure you take that with a meal because it's, uh, it's an acid there. Uh, as also been shown, be very effective, including people in the ICU in China. They had this patient they were losing and they gave them a, a bolus of uh, of very higher dose of vitamin C and they could literally see the patient getting better. Vitamin D, we talked about that. That's consistent, everything I've read so far. Uh, if you're over the age of 50, you use multivitamin B. I use multivitamin B, uh, the B12 in particular. Um, and then uh, curcumin, which is what I also use. And take the curcumin, that's turmeric plus a black pepper, because that goes through the blood brain barrier. There's some great one on Amazon. Uh, Omega 3, which is the fish oil. Melatonin, uh, I'll talk more about that. There's clearly a relationship between how well you're sleeping and melatonin, and basically be able to resist to COVID there. Um, so um, on the lifestyle, uh, there's the traditional lifestyle, but you know, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, so again, it's a very heavy graphic there, which is, you know, a lot of people have depression and anxiety there. So really keeping in, in connection with partners and friends to manage your mental state, exercise, 
all the traditional things about what you should do for exercise, stress management. We're all under heavy stress right now, especially in California. Nothing seems to stop to hit us. Uh, so, you know, just be aware that you need to look at your heart rate variability and a lot of things to get the stress out of your body there. The big thing I'm going to talk about is sleep. Uh, there's clearly a relationship between split and, and complication of COVID. Now, what they talk about is developing a resilient mindset. And there's a lot of application that you can do to help you um, react differently based on the stress that's coming to you. Stress happens to all of us. It's how you react to it. That's really important there. Of course, meditation, breathing, and all of that is a big thing. And then go outdoor. Remember, UV is fantastic for you. It kills it kills it, but also helps, you know, the vitamin D and all those things. So let's talk about sleep. Um, they have done a relationship that sleep does protect the body against the common cold. And remember, the common cold, a third of the common cold are linked to the coronavirus as cousins. And so uh, they really uh, have been recommending to if people, if you're having a problem with all the stress and everything that's going on, to use melatonin. Because melatonin is not only an antioxidant, but it also helps you getting a longer period of, of sleep, which helps you basically uh, strengthen your immune system there. And, and so, uh, so you may want to look uh, into uh, melatonin if you're having any sleep related issues there. So uh, stress is aggravating COVID. Uh, we need to understand that we're all in a massive acute stress across the country right now between wildfires, politics, bad air in California and COVID and God knows what else is happening if you lost your job. And, and what happens with, with, with stress is that you create this cytokine. Remember the big problem with severity is the cytokine storm. And so, so you really want uh, to control that. And it also has this, this reaction there inside the universal world. And remember, COVID creates blood clots. And then you go back to some of my prior video on how destructive the blood clots are in creating uh, injuries to the heart and then uh, you know, strokes and other problems there. So uh, uh, stress is not just I'm anxious and you blow up once in a while. It does affect your body. It does affect if you have COVID, uh, some of the damage that COVID can, can inflict on you. So uh, how do we control what happens to us? And there's a couple of uh, books that we're recommending there is that you control how your body responds to a situation. We don't control the outside world, but we do respond, you know, how our body uh, responds to it. So there's a lot of things you can take a look here, but, uh, you know, really, um, you know, be aware that we're all very stressed and it is affecting your immune system. So again, I go back, uh, it's an election year. This is this 102 year old lady there who basically has been voting since 1940. And she had a PPE designed by her grandson. And so please vote, uh, take, take extra step and precaution. I don't know if you have to develop like a whole uh, outfit like she did, uh, but uh, please vote and be safe. And uh, if you don't know, I'm putting on YouTube this PDF, sorry, my dog is going crazy, uh, this PDF uh, that shows all the prior videos. And if you click on the links there, it will give you a timestamp and exact location where these videos are. And thanks to uh, one of my followers who's been so wonderful at putting this together. We have a timestamp also showing all the prior video and the content. So see you in, in two weeks. Uh, if you haven't seen the epidemiology, I really recommend you see it. There's a lot of things happening right now with an upsurge again in the US and in the world. And the next four to six weeks are going to be critical. So please post this video, share it to as many people as possible. We all need to step in to control what's coming. Otherwise, we're going to get a catastrophic winter. And, and I hate to say that all the thought leaders I've been talking to in the last two weeks are very pessimistic. Uh, and so we don't want this to happen. So I need your help. Please post it, give me a thumbs up and see you in two weeks. Thank you.